полигон. В этом выпуске настоящая летающая крепость. Один из самых загадочных проектов немецких инженеров. Wait, wait, there's been some misunderstanding. It's the shooting range, right? Yeah, okay. So I should be narrating this, not, not the other guy. Yeah, good. Sorry, guys, there's been a mix-up. You know what? Let's skip the intro and get right to the point. It will be smooth sailing from now on. It's always fascinating to talk about experiments, especially successful ones. One of such experiments led to the creation of the Vought XF-5U Navy fighter. Just look at this beauty. And it's not all looks. The XF-5U is as fast and nimble as the Tiger Cat and has enough punch to rival the legendary Bearcat. It carries four 20mm guns and enough ammo to send a dozen pilots to their hangars. If you're a good shot, of course. In other words, the flying flapjack has lots of tricks up its sleeve. Thanks to its one-piece all-metal body, the aircraft is extremely durable. If you want to bring it down, you'll have to get rid of all its control surfaces or engines. And there are two of them, by the way. The XF-5U is so structurally solid that you'll need something akin to a wrecking ball to do lasting damage to the other parts of the aircraft. And even then, the damaged flying flapjack can often make it to the friendly airfield to get some repairs and go back into the fray. You're all alone and have to defend the base against a horde of enemy bombers? No worries. A few enemy fighters are engaging you all at once? No problem. It feels like this plane was built for some advanced heroics. Speaking of heroics, head-on attacks are your bread and butter. Due to the peculiar design of the fighter, the opponents will have almost nothing to shoot at, which means that you're more likely to survive the engagement and it will have more time for aiming. Don't forget to use your rudder. The aircraft is very responsive and has excellent maneuverability. Just don't overdo it. It spins like there's no tomorrow. Want to climb at 30 degrees? Why not? Use the combined power of your engines to get to higher altitudes faster than any of your enemies, and then crush any resistance. Now let's talk about yet another, even more exciting experimental design. When Nazis came to power, they wasted no time and immediately started to work on a multitude of military projects, trying to build a well-honed war machine that could take on the world. But soon they realized that there was no way they could match the combined industrial and scientific might of the opposing forces, at least if they relied on conventional methods. That's when Nazis started to consider other options, even the most bizarre ones. Surprisingly, the approach paid off fairly well. In 1939, one of the Ananurbi expeditions sent to Tibet came back with an amazing find, an almost complete and accurate description of an ancient Mercury torsion NTG engine and a kind of an assembly manual explaining how to build one. History is hardly fair. Who knows what kind of world would we live in now if this knowledge fell into the right hands? Alas, it were the German scientists of the Third Reich who got that unique glimpse into the technological legacy of the ancient Indo-Aryan civilization. They attempted to recreate the technology right away, but it turned out that it wasn't a trifling task. One thing was that they had to work with mere copies of original blueprints riddled with mistakes, submissions, and discrepancies. The other problem was that they had to build the engine with regard to the technological limitations of their time. It was early in 1942 when they finally succeeded in finding the right approach and built the first aircraft equipped with an NTG engine. The design proved to be fatally unreliable, but it was a real breakthrough. Most of the later great feats of German engineering, including the use of mercury cyanide as a component of an anti-knock compound in gasoline, the swept wing of the MA262 and the Fuckwolf TA1A3, as well as the late war experimental tank designs, were related to the experiments conducted to build the first contemporary NTG engine in the world. But all of that was still in the lap of the future when Ananurbi engineers realized that. Having the engines of such power, they were no longer confined to conventional aerodynamic designs. Simply put, they could make anything fly. That's why their next top-secret aircraft looked nothing like a plane. 
it was kind of a flying battleship, capable of moving through the air and water at breakneck speeds and even reaching near-Earth orbit. It is still not clear if Germans tried to use this technology to get to the moon, even though there are plenty of sources claiming that it actually happened. Most of these accounts are, let's say, of questionable nature. That becomes even more evident if you consider that overall crudity of NTG engines that were available to them. Luckily for the Allies, the experimental NTG battleship of Project Eisen Kaput was never used in battle. It came too little, too late. The only existing machine was used to transport Hitler and his entourage to the Nazi safe haven in Antarctica. But it wasn't the end of its story. After the Axis surrendered, the Marine Corps intelligence of the USA were the first to dig through the Ananerbi archives and speak to the people who wrote them. When they found out that the Eisen Kaput was actually real, they quickly came to the conclusion that this technological marvel had to be obtained and thoroughly researched. In 1947, a fleet under the command of Rear Admiral Richard E. Byrd set off to New Swabia to locate and destroy the Nazi base and claim the NTG battleship. It didn't go well. It turned out that the remaining Nazi forces managed not only to polish the design, but also built several battleships of this type. The outcome of the battle was so grim that almost all information concerning this operation was classified for many years, right up until 2005. There were at least four attempts to destroy the last remaining base of the Third Reich throughout the years, and all of them failed badly. Every time a military vessel or an aircraft approached New Schwabia, it was met by a group of swift, fearsome flying battleships. You can surely guess what happened next. Basically, that was one of the reasons why the Antarctic continent was eventually made a demilitarized zone. Even now our understanding of the Eisen Kaput is fragmentary at best, but multiple witness reports and official military statements allowed us to create a model that is accurate to the greatest possible extent. The flight characteristics were also applied according to available data sheets. Let's go back to the ground. There's an amusing little war machine waiting for us. The Bigfoot, an ideal reconnaissance vehicle that is lightning fast, equipped with a powerful engine and fairly well armored. It can drive on any kind of terrain and at a speed of up to 150 kilometers an hour. What else do you need? Maybe a gun? Okay. The good news is that the Bigfoot does carry an 88 millimeter cannon. The bad news is that this gun is so well hidden that there's no gun sight and seemingly no way to open fire. Do not let that discourage you, it's solo part of a big plan. In the meantime, try ramming instead. Just imagine it, you're driving the Bigfoot, minding your own business and then you see an enemy heavy tank occupying the point like they own it. This won't do. Gather some momentum and crash into that heavy vehicle with great vengeance and righteous anger. Yeah, that's more like it. Remember, if an enemy is completely flipped over, it's almost as good as destroyed in most scenarios. Always know where you're going. Choose the shortest possible route to get there and then hit gas as hard as you can. The Bigfoot will take care of the rest. It gets a bit drifty at times, that's true, so there's definitely some skill involved. But that's nothing a good driver can't handle, right? Cross the mountains, climb the walls, take the opposing team unawares. Trust us, they will not be expecting you. They never do. And one last thing, don't forget to capture zones. It's a lot of fun to push enemies into the sea but stay focused. Our team will need to use those points, and you can, and should get them. Now it's time for the traditional as part of our show, Hotline. Developers answering questions from the comments. Strictly speaking, it's not the most serious-minded section of the show. If you want answers to be given with solemn faces, feel free to appeal to the official War Thunder forums. Here we'll have a more light-hearted discussion of the big questions of War Thunder. The first question comes from Burr called Bangleheim. What about submarines? I can't imagine lots of ways to keep it balanced and fun. Well, you don't have to imagine anything, honestly. The submarine has to maintain a balance of air and water in the trim tanks to keep the submarine level at any set depth. You can probably say that it's a key feature of the design. It's well documented as well. 
and we heard that it's pretty fun. Sailors love it. Then a player called Say Gaming asks, Gaijin, will you ever go backwards and implement World War I air vehicles? Yeah, actually, no. Uh, why stop there? We will go even further. In fact, we're planning to dig into the American Civil War. There were lots of interesting things happening there. Then there were the Napoleonic Wars, the War of the Roses, Crusades, and the Fall of Rome. The opportunities are virtually endless. Adam and Gaming writes, All right, this one might seem stupid, but I want a flying tank. They're a real thing, as seen in Russia with their A-40 and etc. I would love to have one in RB so you could spawn in the air then glide to the battlefield and fight it there. It's a great idea, buddy, especially given the fact that we already have a flying Nazi spaceship in the game. Yeah, we can see that happening. We will probably have a separate game mode where you can play only as gliding Soviet air tanks. That would be amazing. The last question comes from a player called Hanvolt. Hey Gaijin. How many lows could Rob Lowe rob if Rob Lowe could rob lows? Well, ask him, how should we know? That's it for today, but feel free to write your questions in the comments below. We do read them all, and you might see some of them answered in the next episode. If you like what we're doing, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you on the shooting range.